Greetings all. Last Outrider here bringing you the next part of the Eye of Terror series, the 13th Black Crusade. And this is going to be uh, continuing the narrative of basically news reports that uh, the Imperium is, is issuing or in inquisitorial intelligence reports, whatever you want, of what's happening. And now the fun part is, if you listen close enough, you should be able to figure out which famous 40K uh, characters are doing what during the 13th Crusade without them having to actually be named. So let's see if you can do that. We started off last time. I'm going to read the, the, the sentence that, from the last video. The pylons appeared to be holding back the power of warp storm Baphomel, but were slowly but surely destroying themselves in the process. So that's where we left off. Now, disintegration. Yet more reports of brutal raids filtered back to Segmentum Command echoing the savagery of the attack on Dentor. Isolated settlements in the Sarlax and Amistel systems fell to the mysterious raiders. With each attack more vicious and bloodthirsty than the last. Naval patrols attempted to police the space around the eastern range fringes of the Agrippina sector, but their Resources were stretched thinly as it was. Following yet another raid, this time against an Imperial research facility on Malin's Reach, the 31st Destroyer Squadron, Deathbringers, operating out of Deimos Binary, was attacked and destroyed by unknown ambushers. External pick capture recovered by salvage teams recorded confused images of what appeared to be twisted and perverted variants of the Space Marine vessels attacking the Cobra class destroyers. And internal logs, though fragmentary, showed borders in blue and gold armor butchering the crew. As the attacks continued, the Navy pulled all of its ships back to the port, and tactical strategos identified a pattern in the attacks that appeared to be moving inexorably inward from the eastern hub subsectors and directly towards Cadia. As naval forces in the Agrippina sector retreated to their bases, Yet more disaster was to befall the beleaguered Imperial forces. On Lelithar, a powerful figure arose amongst the raving cults and fanatics, proclaiming himself the voice of the Emperor. An orator of supreme skill, this, his passionate speeches and screaming fanatics overran those facilities that remained in Imperial hands, such as spaceports and fortified military bases. Scores of the ships and entire arsenals of weaponry were seized by the followers of the Voice and took to the stars. His emissaries spread throughout the system, and Cults of the Voice emerged on Yeor, Amistel, Albatern, and even amongst the inmates of the prison world of Bar-El. As destructive as the cults of the Voice were, they spurred a battered Imperium into life. Preachers and missionaries of the Missionarius Galaxia spreading through the affected regions and decrying the evil of the anti-imperial cult. Imperial faith rose like a phoenix from the flames, and furious battles erupted between the followers of the voice and the pious servants of the emperor. 
far from destroying the faith of these sectors, there was a resurgence of vows of piety. Imperial assassins and kill teams were dispatched to terminate this cult leader, though none were ever seen again. Only one garbled communication from a lone Vindicar assassin gives a clue as to the identity of the voice of the emperor, a hooded figure carrying a sword and a pair of exquisite pistols. Betrayal on Cadia. Despite disintegrating imperial rule throughout the sectors surrounding the Eye of Terror, Cadia remained a disciplined center of control. To combat the increasing frequency and scale of chaos activities, the military high command ordered that every shock troop regiment muster on Cadia. Hundreds of extra landing fields were constructed at Kasser Tyrock, and the infrastructure required to support such a muster gathered from Kasser Holm, Hilotas, and Fremas. Millions of soldiers had already been assembled when the Volskani Regiment, considered by many to be the most hardened fighters in the sector, landed on Cadia. Vast dropships brought Leviathan command transports onto Cadian soil, and as the high command prepared to receive the salute of the newly arrived regiment, the Vols Kandani revealed their true colors. Banners bearing blasphemous chaos icons unfurled from the building-sized transports, and their massive guns opened fire, destroying the command leviathan of Governor Primus Maris Polska. Volskani troops poured onto the landing fields and attacked the awaiting Cadians, falling on them with unbridled savagery and killing with the ferocity and discipline they were famed for. Battle raged around the spaceport for over an hour, but with so many defenders in place, there could only be one outcome. The Volscani were defeated, but at a terrible cost. The governor Primus and most the ranking officers were dead, and what was left of the Cadian command structure struggled to maintain order. As the last scattered pockets of resistance were hunted down, Lord Castellan, Ursakar Creed, took over the reeling Cadian forces, quickly restoring a measure of command and control following the atrocity. As Ursakar Creed fought on the bloody fields of Kasser Tyrock, the most trusted advisor to the governor Secundus collapsed deep inside the fortress of Kasser Vazan. His body bloating and rotting in a manner all too familiar to the Kyurgians of the Cadian sector. The Kasserkin reacted with admirable speed, but it was too late for the troopers of Kasser Vazan, and within an hour, the entire fortress was declared unclean and sealed forever. The Calm Before the Storm There could be no doubt now that a major incursion from the Eye of Terror was imminent, and the newly instated governor Primus Usarkar Creed ordered the Cadian forces to dig in, strengthening their defenses, stockpiling munitions, war material, and food 
and water. Hurried pleas for aid from forces beyond the Cadian sector were dispatched with the highest authoritarian authentication codes. And within days, missives from the Space Wolves and a number of other chapters of Space Marines arrived, pledging warriors and naval assets to join the fight. Regimental musters were begun in scores of nearby sectors as the administratum reacted to the threat with a haste unheard of in such a monolithic organization. Imperial forces were gathering. But it would be many weeks, if not months, before enough strength could be gathered. In addition, an unconfirmed report of a fortress monastery afloat on a massive bedrock was filed by Captain Urquarn of the Gothic-class cruiser, Abigail's Glory. But many of the ship's crew were suffering from fatigue from long hours and tours of duty, and this report was dismissed as hallucinations of an overtired crew. In addition to this, Cobra squadrons patrolling the edges of the Eye of Terror filed numerous sightings of Eldar ships. Though the Navy was unable to engage the aliens, as their speed soon carried them beyond weapons range. The fleet command was at first alarmed by these reports, but the Eldar ships seemed more concerned with flight than combat, and there was no reported engagements between the two forces. Hurried investigations of the worlds the Eldar were abandoning revealed them to be unusually verdant, with strange xeno-constructions that astropaths divined to be warp gates that had been recently and permanently sealed. Why the Eldar would abandon these worlds and seal off their precious warp gates was just one of the mysteries amongst hundreds that had surfaced in the preceding months, and there was not the resources to investigate them fully. As the Cadian forces prepared for the inevitable attack, yet more assaults from the unknown raiders hit the Tabor and Ulthor systems. But this time, vessels of the Imperial Navy were in position to counterattack. Three squadrons of Cobra destroyers, in conjunction with the lunar class cruiser Goliath, pursued the attackers into the Fabrinius Straits, and in a fearsome battle, crippled the Styx class cruiser Dark Blood. The engagement cost the Navy most of the Cobras and the Goliath was severely damaged. But at last, the attackers had been identified. The Dark Blood was codified as being attached to the Night Lord's war leader, Tarek Dark Blood, one of the most vicious killers in a legion replete with sadistic butchers. Before Imperial reinforcements could arrive, a huge force of chaos warships were picked up on the long-range augers, and the surviving Imperial vessels were forced to withdraw, limping to the safety of the nearby port of Orent. And next time, the storm breaks. Until then, bye!